When is a disability not a disability? In 1983, a chap called Mike Oliver coined a phrase which would literally change the landscape for disabled people. His straightforward concept has grown and been built upon ever since, but is still much misunderstood even by its supporters and frequently misrepresented by its detractors. The phrase was the social model of disability, an alternative to the prevailing medical model which historically dominated public attitudes and government policy towards disability. The social model challenges the medical paradigm and the environment we inhabit in equal measure. The responsibility for basic quality of life is seen as a shared effort rather than an individual struggle. The origins of the phrase and the work that followed go back decades, but first gained momentum in the 1970s within the civil rights movements led by people who were disabled themselves, as opposed to charities and doctors who had monopolised the narrative before. Those pioneers put it to the world that our modern societies can't boast of our progress, whilst disabled people are denied equality of opportunity to work, to participate and to maximise our quality of life. To them, disability is not defined by impairment alone, but is a direct result of forced inequality in a world that is designed and maintained by people who cater for the most commonplace abilities. People who are impaired are still people, and deserve the same rights and opportunities as all who are unimpaired. Disability is in large part the imposition of a society which values convenience above all. The established medical model, on the other hand, directly contradicts this ideal. Under the medical model, there is no distinction between impairment and disability. The two words are almost interchangeable. It presupposes that society is not broken. Disabled people are, and they must be fixed in order to enjoy the same quality of life as those who are unimpaired. This is Pete. Pete's paralysed below the waist and uses a wheelchair to get around. He can't get through the doorway of his doctor's surgery because it's too narrow for his wheelchair. How would we solve this problem under the social and the medical models? The medical model dictates that Pete must be at least partially cured of his impairments or his symptoms, sufficiently that he'd be able to walk through the door like everyone else. His disability is due to his incompatibility with the existing environment. No cure means no access, and that is the end of the matter. Under the social model, the doorway not being wide enough to accommodate his means of locomotion is the immediate disabling factor, and can be addressed by widening the doorway. An automatic door would be helpful addition too. By applying the social model, we don't put the burden on Pete as a problem he must fix. We expect those responsible for access to make accommodations for people in wheelchairs. You might ask, if Pete's disability is caused by social and environmental factors, why is he trying to get into the doctors in the first place? That very question is at the heart of most misunderstandings, and certainly almost every misrepresentation of the social model by those who oppose it. You might think that in an ideal world, the social model and the medical model would work side by side towards a common goal of reducing the difficulties of disabled people, but there is a fundamental incompatibility between the two. It lies right at the starting point of each model. The medical model is only effective if we are safe to assume that society is already as accommodating of differences as it can be. The social model acknowledges that society may be broken, or at least has room for improvement. You see, medicine is already included as part of the social model. Yes, it takes its name from the social and environmental changes omitted from the medical model, but the social model doesn't stop medicine in its tracks. In fact, it encourages it. For all the power inherent in assisting the everyday lives of disabled people, it doesn't for one moment mean that the search for cures or assistive drugs, therapies and appliances should stop. You can't expect the social model to be implemented alongside the medical model because medicine is already an essential 
aspect of the social model. The long-established medical model is a different kettle of fish, though. There is no place for social or environmental change within its principles. It is founded on the basis of us already living in an ideal world in which the impaired individual is deficient. The only way for the individual to achieve equality is for them to be the same as everyone else. Uniformity of ability is its only accepted solution. Therefore, impairment and disability are one and the same. It's essentially medical fundamentalism. It's their way or not at all. Whilst the social model is a modern, balanced view which includes both social and medical advancements to improve lives, the medical model is its miserly, archaic cousin, steadfastly refusing to accept that the world is changing. Where such one-track thinking takes us is an ugly place few of us would wish to revisit. In the 20th century, hundreds of thousands of people, including children, were slaughtered by dictators because of their deficiency. Throughout history, and even today in some parts of the world, disability is not seen as an issue because disabled people would die young, be hidden from sight by family or state, or be euthanised. That is the medical model at its fullest political and social extent. It is not a model of disability, as the name suggests, but a model of conformity and compliance. People who do not fit the ideal image of those who set the agenda are deemed as non-people and subject to the choice of change or die. The idealistic campaigners of the 1960s and 70s portrayed social change as the polar opposite of the medical model and perhaps inevitably drastically underplayed the role of medicine in disability rights and equality. The social model that grew from those seeds has long since ventured beyond such blinkered binary thinking to recognise that the option to be cured is an essential choice that cannot be denied if available. Freedom and equality depend upon choice. For someone like Pete, his paralysis is not easily fixed. There may be no treatment available. It could be unaffordable or there might be a years long waiting list. The social model provides for his needs until such time as a cure is a viable option for him. The social and environmental changes that benefit Pete will of course benefit everyone else with a similar impairment too. The quality of life of hundreds of Pete's neighbours could be improved simply by that one doctor's surgery fitting new, wider doors. When a viable cure becomes available, Pete may no longer need his share. Of course, since the social model includes the element of choice to be cured, it must also include the opposite, the choice not to be cured. You may ask why someone in a wheelchair like Pete might choose to stay that way. Wouldn't everybody prefer to be walking on their own two legs than restricted to a chair? It seems like an easy answer, but there are any number of reasons why Pete may choose to remain as he is. Perhaps he has no way of affording the operation he would need. Maybe he's been on the waiting list so long he's given up hope. What if the operation only has a 20% chance of success with death or full paralysis as the alternative? What if it was a 50% chance? How many people would willingly gamble their life on such odds? Those may be reasonably easy reasons to understand, but Pete has the right to choose whatever the circumstances. What if he has spent so many years adapting to his way of life he prefers to continue as he is? What if the friends he has made and the activities he now enjoys are such an integral part of his life, restoring his ability to walk would actually lessen his happiness and sense of well-being? Is it actually of benefit to him to cure his impairment if it would harm his quality of life? The social model of disability embodies the finest aspects of human nature and endeavour. It supports equality, freedom and choice for a segment of society that has historically been denied them. It encourages progress in medicine, technology, education, acceptance, social attitudes and government policy. The medical model has dominated since before medicine was even a recognised profession, but now it has been eclipsed by something bigger and better by far. As nations and as a civilization, 
we can make the choice to accept and embrace disabled people as equals in our society and remove barriers to access and inclusion, or we can retreat into the dark ages, hiding from sight anyone who cannot conform to an arbitrary definition of normal. Disability can strike any one of us at any time. We may be born with an impairment, or our children could. It could be the result of illness, infection or injury. None of us is immune to the possibility. The way we treat others is the way we ourselves will be treated if or when we become impaired ourselves. The choice between the social model of disability and the medical model should be no choice at all. It is a choice between stagnation and progress, suppression and freedom, cruelty and kindness, darkness and light. Which of those words describe the world you want to live in? Thank you for watching.